Now, I want to come back to your your what this person might say about mTOR and IGF-1. I've heard these things are bad. You know, what 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 would you say? And there's been a lot of I, I know David Sinclair has has brought a lot of stuff and saying, you know, I really try to limit mTOR and IGF-1. And it will never cease to amaze me how many scientists do not understand the difference between a short-term truncated acute response to a stressor versus dysregulated signaling that persists indefinitely. And what I mean is when you look at mTOR elevations that, that lead to cancer and whatnot, those originate at what I would say mostly insulin resistance. So you're having elevations in insulin, you're having elevations in insulin signaling through AKT, which, which can then transmit to mTOR. And so you, it's like this chronic kind of low level pushing that button, right? As opposed to a pulsatile. That is a big difference mm. between a, a dose of protein that causes mTOR to rise, go back down in a natural rhythm, okay? Also tissue specific. We're talking about in skeletal muscle, not liver, not brain mm -hmm. necessarily, those sorts of things. IGF-1, same deal. And what I will say is, where are all the resistance trained people that are getting cancer by the droves? Because if you want to talk about amplitude of response from mTOR, resistance training dwarfs what protein does. If we look at the meta-analyses on cancer incidents amongst resistance trainers, and there's getting to be some now, we see lower levels of cancer in people who resistance train. So what that tells me is there's a difference between these two signals. And I want to point out something there because I think it would be very quick to say, but Lane, there's a healthy user bias there, blah, 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 blah. I don't think what you're saying is that that proves that lifting makes you live longer. I think what you're actually saying is, no, it's the contrapositive. It demonstrates it that lifting doesn't increase mTOR to the point of it being detrimental to your health. That can be asserted, I think, from that observation. Or that it's tissue, also tissue specific. Um, that, that's part of it. Um, let's, let's, let's use a different example. So let's look at exercise in general. So if you were, Peter, if you got educated medical school, but knew nothing about exercise. Yeah, I love this. To, yeah, this is one of my favorite discussions. You know where right? I'm going with this. I, 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 I yeah. And I told you, I'm going to do something that's going to make you elevate your heart rate, elevate your inflammatory markers, elevate your reactive oxygen species, Increase raise hepatic your blood glucose pressure. Increase glucose output. output. Yep. Yeah. What, what would you say to me about that? Yeah, of course I'd say, yeah, this, is, this can't Horrible. be good for you. Don't do that. Yeah. And what does exercise do? It does all those things, sure. yeah. right? So why is exercise good for us? Because that is a short-term stressor. I mean, we use the term hormesis if you want, um, that the body responds to and it actually acts kind of like a vaccine. I realize that's like a really triggering term for a lot of people right now, but it's like, it's like a vaccine, right? It's a controlled dose of a stressor that your body can handle. And I kind of look at protein, this, I wouldn't say protein's a stressor necessarily, but again, it's this acute response versus a chronic hum, right? Your inflammatory markers, like people who deal with like elevated inflammation, it's not actually super high elevations, but it's just all the time. That chronic pulse on that, that is the problem. That is the issue. And again, you, you said, they might say, well, there's healthy user bias there. And I would say, well, so what? Okay. Um, so you're saying that people who have high rates of IGF-1 and mTOR who are healthy, okay, well, show me them getting higher incidence of cancer. You, you can't. <laughs> right. You can't because all these things are tied together because people who have high levels of mTOR activation and IGF-1 typically have insulin resistance. They have poor dietary habits and poor lifestyle habits. So I would say that it okay, that's a, a fair point. There, there's confounding variables, but all these things are tied up together. You can't really separate them. Um, and again, am I, am I saying that mTOR plays absolutely no role? No, but you know, you're kind, again, it can be cart before the horse sort of thing. Like um, people say, well, rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor and that's a cancer treatment drug. And I would say, yes, but do you think it's a good idea to take do chemotherapy to prevent cancer. 
I don't think so. I, I don't think radiation well, is well, a good it's, idea. It's, to it's, it's, it's not even really true because rapamycin is not really, I mean, it's never really been a particularly successful cancer therapeutic. It used constitutively, which is how it would be used. Uh, obviously, I'm, I think rapamycin does have significant longevity benefits in basically all models that aren't humans. So the extrapolation would be pulsatile rapamycin is probably beneficial, but it's in, in that application, it's not really being taken to constantly suppress mTOR. Because remember, if you took it all the time, you're suppressing mTOR complex two and mTOR complex one. So, um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that point actually completely, which is that tissue specificity and time course are very difficult things to, um, infer from the outside, which is sort yeah. of the, the meta view of all things equal, you know, IGF levels have a J curve with mortality and therefore very, very high levels of IGF must be problematic and high protein increases IGF and therefore must be bad. And I think it's important to also understand the following. And that is, I think we have this idea, I think I might've missed this on the last show, but I think we have this idea that like there's this perfect diet out there. That's going to be the one diet that's going to, you know, help, you know, reduce cancer and cardiovascular disease and mortality and all. And the fact is that there's probably trade-offs for everything, right? I, I'm not, I know there's people out there that will say that protein increases cancer. Well, there's a ton of confounders to that. Like somebody saying, well, there's healthy user bias. Sure. But there's a ton of confounders to people who eat high protein. Most protein in these meta-analyses looking at cancer, I mean, you're talking about high protein is above, you know, 70 grams of protein per day or 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Okay. Well, where do most people, most Americans eat high protein by definition of the RDA, but where is it from? It's from burgers and hot dogs and like a bunch of processed meat. So what is, what does the cancer incidence say about people who have high protein, but an overall healthy diet? And there was a really interesting cohort study out of Alberta in a hundred thousand people where they said, okay, we're going to look at meat intake. And I think even red meat intake specifically, we're going to look at low, medium, and high levels of red meat intake, but also with low, medium, and high levels of fruit and vegetable intake. And because here's the big, the big uh, thing is most people who eat high levels of meat and protein eat low levels of fruits and vegetables. What they found was that at the highest levels of meat intake, but also with the highest levels of fruit and vegetable intake, there was no difference in cancer incidence between the lowest level of fruit or uh, the lowest level of meat intake. And even with the highest level of fruit and vegetable intake, it's not an issue. So what in that other words, it's seems, a marker for overall diet quality is bingo. Yeah. So, and I, again, I don't want to extrapolate too much out of one study, even though it was a large study. Um, but what that would seem to suggest is that overall diet quality is the big rock that we're looking at here. And, and you can achieve good diet quality on a whole host of different diets. I mean, you can have a ketogenic diet that's very poor quality diet. You can have a ketogenic diet that's very high quality diet. You can have a plant-based diet that's very low quality. And you can have a plant base that's very high quality. You can have intermittent fasting that's low quality and, and so on and so forth. A lot of it boils down to like, what are the food choices you're making on balance? You know, are you getting enough fruits and vegetables and minerals and, and, and micronutrients? And even then, you know, it, it's so interesting. Every time we try to say, okay, well, fruits and vegetables have these, you know, these benefits on health that we see pretty consistently. So let's try and take out these isolated micronutrients and give them in a supplement. It, it, we just, we're always disappointed with the results. And it just seems to be a little bit of mother nature's kitchen. You know what I mean? That you, you, you kind of have to eat the whole food to really get those benefits. Um, but yeah, I, th I think again, if the mTOR story were true in terms of dietary protein, we would have expected in that study to see a linear increase in cancer, especially at each level of fruit and vegetable intake. But we didn't. What we saw was more of a linear inverse association with fruit and vegetable intake is what we saw.